Okay, so we're game day weekend. We got the Super Bowl tonight. How many of y'all are pumped about the Super Bowl? How many of you guys are completely indifferent? You don't care at all? Okay. How many of you guys are going for the 49ers? Come on. Okay. All right. Okay. How many of you guys are going for the Chiefs? Oh, wow. How many of you guys are literally only watching for the commercials? Okay. So here's the deal. I love football. Uh, I never was allowed to play football. And I'm going to talk about that uh, here in just a moment. My mom's actually watching right now. Hello. <laughs> this is about you, Barbara. Okay. I wasn't allowed to play football because my mom would say these really dramatic statements like, you're not playing football. You'll break every single bone in your body. I'm like, oh. But she did teach me to make a good casserole. Thanks, Barb. Uh, she'll fight me if I ever call her Barb. But you're not here. <laughs> Uh, but I never got to play football other than like in the neighborhood or flag football. I played basketball, almost actually went overseas. Whoa, somebody loved basketball. Played basketball. I love football. More college football buff. Uh, I'm an Ohio State Buckeye. Sorry if that offends any of you, but I, I'm pumped about the game tonight. So I love football. I understand football. I can throw a football. I can play football, but I never cultivated the, the real skill set to play because I never got to play like in a, in like a coach setting or whatever. Uh, but I, I can appreciate it and I can watch it. But there's something that I got to let you in on. 15 years ago, my wife and I got married. They did not cover this in premarital counseling. I, I believe they should have. Uh, because we were on the beach in Maui and my wife reaches in this bag and she pulls out a premium football. She's like, you play football, right? I was like, is the shark like snacks? Yeah, I play football. And she's like, let's throw some football. And she has an arm on her like a pro. I'm like, where did you come from? And so she's whipping this ball and I'm like, okay. You, you gotta run, you gotta run. I thought we were just, this was casual, but everything's competition. So she whips this ball a little too high over my head and into the water. Mom, I know you're watching. Barbara, the other um, thing I need to uh, talk to you about is I wasn't ever really uh, allowed to go around large bodies of water. Because uh, she would say things like, you'll drown, and if you don't drown, a shark will eat you. <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, so it's not that I can't swim. I can swim, y'all. But uh, I just had never really been around the whole, like, riptide and, like, you don't swim against it. You swim to the side of it. And so the it goes over my head and it's bloop in the water. And I'm like... <laughs> And so I try to reach for it, and, and it's like seven, eight feet, and I can't get it. And I turn, and I was like, you threw it over my head. And she's like, get it. Just go get the ball. And I'm like, yeah, right. And I turn, and it's like 30 feet from me. And I'm like, okay. So I start swimming towards it, and, and it's, it's just like I can't catch it. It's like Wilson on Castaway. I can't, I see it, and I'm like trying to reach, and I'm like, it's, it's, it's out there. And she's like, yeah, I, I know, get, get the ball. Go get it. And she's like, I don't know. Yeah, we just got married. I don't get the ball. And so I'm like, it's now 150 feet from me. And I'm like, <coughs> okay, I can't feel the ground anymore. And so I ended up just swimming back in and I walked up on the shore, like so defeated. Like, I don't know. It's out there. And this guy, you know, the, you know, that one guy that's on the beach, you do instantly hear that. Like he's a little too tan. Like, I don't know if it's Panama Jack or butter. I don't know what was all over him. He's wearing little beach shorts that I confused for a belt. Like, and he walks up like this and he's like, <laughs> do, you, do you want me to get it? And I was like, we're good, David Hasselhoff. <laughs> you can take a break. I got this. I'll go out there and drown on, for the honor. He's like, I got this. And you could tell that he was not raised by Barbara because he had been around water. When he jumped in, y'all, the water did not move. It was like, bloop. I was like, that was impressive. Actually, that was, and he was gone. Like, I didn't see him anymore. And I was like, this guy died for me not being able to get, and he comes up out of nowhere with the ball. And my wife's like, that's what you were supposed to do. I'm like, I'll never be able to do that. Like, he works at SeaWorld. There's no way. He has gills. He's breathing under the water. This isn't okay. He comes up out of the water, literally like a torpedo, and rocket launches this football with dolphin stealth force and it comes flying at me and I don't know if it was the sun in my eyes or the glare off of his shiny chest but I could not see it about halfway and I was like where did it go and it hit me so hard in the chest it knocked the wind out of me and I picked up the ball and I handed it to my wife I was like I didn't play football Barbara and so anyways that's my football story okay I love my mom give my mom a hand I don't know Yikes, stickity C. All right, hey, if you're taking down notes, which we always encourage you to, Harvard did a study, Harvard Community College, so not quite Harvard, uh, but Harvard did this study <laughs> that said that if you're a hearer only, you retain 5% of what you hear. But if you actually take down notes in real time, it goes up to 35%. If you take down notes and go back and watch maybe an archive message or 
restream it. It goes up to as high as 90 to 95%. If you're taking down notes, the title of the sermon this weekend is Run the Play. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, Run the Play. Now we're going to be talking about football and I know some of you instantly disconnected like, uh, game day weekend. I just don't play sports. I don't care about sports. I believe the Holy Spirit will download something to you through his word. Just position yourself to receive today. We're going to be talking about running the play, but I want to unpack something that's a little bit different than the excitement of the touchdowns and the passes and the running plays. Because here's the truth. That's what we're celebrating. That's what we're excited about. That's what we go back and watch top 10 ESPN plays. But there's something else that's crucial and super important to the actual game. And it's called the huddle. Say the huddle. The huddle's never celebrated. Nobody's on the sidelines like, look at that huddle. Man, I love how they just get in there and they talk and we have no idea what they're saying. That is amazing. No, but the huddle is absolutely essential and it's crucial. And the definition of the word huddle is actually a brief gathering of players during a game to receive instructions. A group of people consulting, a discussion, a talk, a meeting, a conference. Again, we're excited about the big plays, but the plays don't happen until the huddle happens. This is my, this is my snapshot evaluation of Hope City. I believe God is like the coach coaching team and he speaks through the Holy Spirit, the head coach and the Holy Spirit speaks to our quarterback who's Pastor Jeremy. This right here is our huddle. So look at the person next to you and say, you're invited to the huddle. Let them know. Hey, you're invited to the huddle. And I believe God downloads through our quarterback the sermon, the plays, and we go out and we do, and what we do is we run the plays. Now, Pastor Jeremy, our main quarterback's not here, so you all got the backup quarterback, White Chocolate, but I'm gonna give you some plays today, and I believe that will equip you to go out into all the world and do what we're called to do. Jesus actually said this in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. There's three plays that I believe will challenge us and equip us. It says, and then he told them. So this is Jesus. Watch this, what's the first word? It says, go! into all the world and preach the good news to a few people, to a handful of people that you get along with, to just your small elite group, to people that look just like you, that talk like you, to only people that you get along with at work, to that neighbor that doesn't give you the H-town thumbs up with the wrong finger, like you avoid that person. No, what's it say? Go into all the world and preach the good news, the gospel to everyone. Here's the truth. I believe we're so quick to judge people based upon the chapter of their lives that we walk in on. But I believe today God's going to unlock us having compassion, seeing people do the filter the way he sees them. Write this down. This is our first play that we're going to run as a church. Number one, we're going to run on purpose. We're going to equals go. We're going to run on purpose because here's the truth. God will never force himself. I say this almost every time I preach. God will never force himself on your life, but he will fill every time you make room. It is an intentionality that we have to have. And I'm grateful for visionary pastors and pastors like Jeremy and Jennifer who are constantly giving us on-ramp and off-ramp moments to serve, to go out, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But we have to run on purpose. When the ball is hiked, the quarterback is expecting one thing from the team, to run the play, to go out and do it on purpose. Simply go. I love the acronym of the word go. And some of you are like, it's two letters. Go. I like this. Get out. We gotta get out of our comfort zone. We gotta get out and serve our community. We gotta get out when there's a serve day, we're the first ones to show up. You gotta jump on. That's why growth track is so important. If you wanna know how to get more connected here, we're passionate about four things here at Hope City specifically. Knowing God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and ultimately make a difference. Growth track step one is starting today. You can jump in and be a part. Where's my dream team at? Come on, wave, where's our dream teamers? All our dream team, because it's literally like a family. We're doing life together. We're choosing to go. Now, instantly, I could tell body language shifted when I said go into all the world. And you have a mission field that you're called to every day. You know where it starts for me? My wife and my kids. I'm downloaded my character and integrity. There's things that I try to adjust and tweak and shift every day so that I don't pass it on to my kids. There are people that are connected to your purpose and your destiny, your neighbors, people at work. You know that one lady or that dude that bothers you? Just maybe God has called you and they're attached to your destiny. I believe this. I believe every day we're called to get in the way of people's storms and ultimately point them to the one that can set them free, heal them, and deliver them. But here's the truth. I think this is a massive misconception. Well, Daniel, I'll do that when my life's a little bit more polished because <laughs> I'm pretty messy. <laughs> I'm duct taped back together. You don't know what I did last night. God does, and he's not looking for perfect. He's looking for purposed. 
and he will heal, shape, and mold you into the call. All you have to do is surrender and lean in and simply say yes. Say that with me. Say yes. Come on. This is what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. This is a little sobering. It says this, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Verse 15, and how will anyone, here's that word again, go and tell them without being sent? Again, that's why I love Hope City. Because not only can you jump in and serve and be a part in growth track, but you know, we have connect groups kicking off this weekend. And this is a way that you can connect. And be, thank, I got nine people. They're like, woo, woo. How many of you guys have been a part of connect groups before? Come on. Over 5,000 people across hundreds of, uh, uh, of connect groups all over the city. This is a way to connect together, to grow together, so that ultimately you can iron sharpen iron, Proverbs 27, 17, and go out and be who God has called you to be. This is pretty sobering. How will anyone go and tell them without being sent? See, inside the huddle weekly, we bring in our baggage we bring in the tags that say fragile and damaged goods and we trade it for his mercy. We trade it in for his grace. We trade it in for his goodness and we go out. We're being sent weekly. How many of you guys are grateful that you can go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus? Come on, you woke up again today. You're breathing, which is proof that God's not done with you yet. I've even got greater news. You've survived 100% of your worst days. Like you're here today. You're doing better than you. No, and I think that this is pretty sobering. And then it goes on and says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. Now, instantly, my thought was, you have never, there's people that are like, you've never seen my wife's feet. <laughs> like, okay, moving on. <laughs> but you are called to go, get out of your comfort zone. And this is, this is something that I think is super important. When you walk with Jesus, there should be a residue on your life. I love this quote, preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. Sometimes the character and the integrity that you walk with, the jokes you don't laugh about, the things that you decide to stay away from, the things that you decide to, to, to be empowering in and light and salt to people's lives, truly the hands and feet of Jesus, sometimes it speaks louder. People will read your life more than they'll read the Bible. So the first play, we gotta run on purpose. Number two, this is our second play. We're gonna run this play. Number two, we're gonna run with love. Now I'm not talking about Romantic love. Some of y'all are like, okay, hey, all my life. I prefer someone like... That is the relationship series. That's not what we're doing. We're talking about agape love. We're talking about the God kind of love. And when you walk in love, walking in love is an action. It's a choice, right? Like a lot of times I think we've gotten flipping. Like, what's up, man? I love you, bro. Oh, wow, I love you. I don't like that guy very much. But the truth is walking in love is a choice to put on the filter in the lens of, okay, Jesus, I want to see this person the way you see them. Guys, I said this a moment ago. We have to be careful to not judge people based upon the chapter of their life that we walked in on. You don't have to be an expert on the origin of where the dirt came from to help someone rinse it off. I think it's so important to get in the way of their storm and say, I can't fix you. I can't help you, but I know who can. And his name is Jesus. We have to walk in love. We have to run with love. I travel a lot, so I encounter a lot of interesting people. And uh, I was on this flight with my wife and my oldest, Brecken, and these guys directly across the aisle from us, man, they were acting out of control. Swearing and vulgar, and there's kids all around, and this dude pulls out a, a, a porno magazine, and he's showing his friend, and they're being super, super aggressive, and just, I couldn't take it. Like, the humanity in me is like, Babe, I'm gonna punch this dude in the nose. Like I'm this close and, and I'm wanting to say, hey bro, can you, and I could just feel my, 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 my flesh. I could feel my, <laughs> my blood pressure rising and I felt the hand, you know the hand. If you're not married yet, you, one day you will. My wife's hand leans over and she just grabs my leg and she's like, don't say anything. I was like, then God needs to deal with him. We're 36,000 feet in the air. God, we're so close. He could just suck him out of the plane. Like start praying with me then now. Come on, Lord, just take him out, God, take him out. Like I, and I just got to the point where I was about to boil over. And listen, I'm not saying I always do everything right. I do think this Jordan 1 uh, skinny jean combo is okay today. All right. Okay, moving on. I don't say I always do everything right. But in this moment, I'm about to turn and say something. And I hear the Holy Spirit. I mean, I felt it reverberate deep within my, my spirit. Say, don't say anything. I'm like, God, then you need to inter intervene. Like, I need an intervention, a providence moment right now. And I heard the Lord say, get out your Bible. Now my iPad, y'all, I pulled out the old school, big King James, like, boom, put the thing down. And I'm like, flipping pages. Just, 
<laughs> and it wasn't three to five minutes. I felt somebody touch me and I turned, it's this dude, like that's assault. I could have punched him right in the nose, just boom. And, and he touched me. I said, what's up, man? And he goes, are you reading the Bible? I said, yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> what are you reading? He shuts the magazine and says, hey, I, I, I'm so sorry. Are you a holy man? <laughs> this is literally how it happened. And I said, uh, yeah, I guess you could say that. And he's like, like, are you some sort of priest? I'm like, no, I'm not a priest, but I, I'm a pastor. I, I want to apologize on behalf of my friend and I, man, the things we've been saying. I'm just so sorry. And this guy begins to dump the past 35 years of his life. I had a grandma that prayed for me and took me to church. My dad died when I was young. My mom ran out on me. My mom's a crackhead, like begins to unpack. I judged him instantly based upon the characteristics and things he was doing. But how, in that moment, I recognized, God, how grateful I am that you would put me in the way of this brother's storm because I believed in that moment he was attached to my destiny. So for 45 minutes, I'm able to pour into him like, bro, there's kids around. Stop doing that stuff. He's like, man, I'm in a really bad spot in my life. He pulled, he's wearing a tank tie. He's got crazy tattoos. I don't know what that strap, it's like a tankini. What's that thing called? Anyways, he moves it over and he has a 22, this is a true story, a 22 slug in his, in his arm. He's like, my girlfriend shot me. It's crazy. I'm like, yeah, that's crazy. What is happening? You need to have that looked at. It's got like this little patch over it. I'm like, that's not going to fix it. Like you got shot with a bullet. It's like. But I'm talking to him about the Lord and we land and we're walking off the jet bridge and he falls to his knees right next to me. And I was like, get up, man, get up, what's happening? He said, I need you to pardon my sins. Like, I'm like, hey, Lord, I pray. And so I just start slapping oil on him. Hit him with the Bible. <laughs> like, I said, stand up, man. And I said, hey, I said it on the plane, but bro, I'm not a priest. Like, that's not what I, I don't believe. I can't pardon anything. I can't. I'll tell you what I can do. Come on. I can introduce you to someone that can set you free, heal you and deliver you right now and restore all hope. His name is Jesus and he can restore everything. And I begin to pray for this guy, gave him my email. You know, we connected him at a church in Tampa. He sends us emails. He's fired up, got the bullet removed. Thank God. And he's moving on with the Lord. Come on. That's amazing. But we have to walk in love. Now again, had a great ending. I, it would have been better if I was like, this guy was acting crazy. I punched him in the nose and they drug me off the flight. You'd be like, this is a weird church. <laughs> Man, the compassion of the Lord began to stir in me. And you know, honestly, it's, it's getting stronger. They say statistically across Christianity, there's two things in decline. I do not believe these statistics are true of Hope City, but they say that in Americanized Christianity, there's two things in decline the past 10 years. One is passion. The people are no longer passionate for the things of God. I think additional seating and across all of our campuses and thousands of people that show up weekly, I think passion is alive here at Hope City. Come on, can we? I believe that. They say the other thing that's in decline in Americanized Christianity is compassion. The people no longer see people. They're caught up in their own humanity that they don't see people. We're so quick to judge people. We're so quick to write people off. But I'm beginning to recognize more and more that there's truly healing in my hands. That just maybe with audacious faith, God is aligning me to get in the way of someone's path to point them, Romans 2 verse 4, to the goodness and love of God that draws a man's heart to a place of freedom. I'm a product of this because the lady went out of her way at a grocery store to tell my mom about Jesus. My dad's dealing drugs and and struggling with alcohol and addiction and cheating and abusing. Everything was chaotic in our life. I'm grateful for someone that woke up and had compassion and still talked about Jesus. Got in the way of our storm. Look at the person next to you and say, come on, you got to run the play. You got to walk in love. Come on, let them know. Jesus said this in John 13 verse 34. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other as much as I love you. Your strong love for others, watch this, will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Mark 12, 30, and you must love the Lord with your, your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Watch this. The second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. But here's the truth. It's hard to take somebody to a place that you're not yourself. In order to love your neighbor, and then this line, as yourself, you have to first receive that agape love. You have to first receive that love and recognize that you're fearfully and wonderfully made Psalms 139, that you're marvelously complex, 
That when you look in the mirror, you don't see insecurity and depression and shame, but you see who God created you to be. And you start getting this, this fire in you that says, devil, you're going to get tired before I do because I'm loved by a good, good father. I'm loved by someone who has never ran out on me, maybe when others have. And then out of the overflow of the love that you've received, you can truly love others. John 13 verse 35 says, this is how everyone will know you are my disciples when you love each other. It's so important to reflect and show people. One of my favorite verses, I reference this all the time, Colossians 3, verse 17. It says, in everything I do, everything I say, I do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. This challenges me every day. Am I looking like and reflecting back in the day? And some of y'all think it's new, but it's old school. Back in the day, we used to wear these, these bands that said WWJD. And people were like, what's that mean? You're like, what would Jesus do? All right. And then when I got married to Jackie, it means what would Jackie do? Because especially when I'm making like choices on what I'm eating. Uh, like Ben and Jerry's ice cream, Chunky Monkey. No, Jackie wouldn't eat this. Mm. What would Jesus do? How are we treating waiters and waitresses? How are we treating our neighbors and coworkers? How are we treating our family? Because here's the truth. You can either be a thermometer that tells the temperature or you can be a thermostat that sets the temperature. When you walk into your job, when you walk into places where you have influence and a sphere of influence, are you an atmosphere changer because the residue of Jesus is on you? Or do you just blend in? They'll know that you're my disciples when you love each other, are we representing? Just right now, just think about it. Do, do a little, do a little self-examination of your life. Are you representing Jesus? Now let me say this as a disclaimer. We're all a work in progress. Like none of us have arise, arrived. Paul said, <laughs> I'm still running after my goal. I, I'm still, I haven't obtained everything yet, but I choose to press on. We have to choose to press on and get healthier and get better every day. Come on, can I get an amen? Come on. So there was a story that I, I ministered, uh, it's probably three, maybe four years ago when we were at Memorial. I told this story towards the end of one of my sermons and I, and I heard the Lord a couple days ago just stirring me to, to tell this story again. It was said in the World War II days and there was a 21 year old guy who decided to fight for our country. And while he was fighting in the war, he got critically injured and they transported him back to these three tents. There's three triage tents. They all looked the same, but the nurses and the staff knew the difference. As soon as he got there, the doctors came in and examined him and they tied a red ribbon around his boot. He didn't know what it meant. None of the other soldiers knew what it meant because they didn't want to kill their morale, but they would tie this red ribbon and this red ribbon to the doctors and the nurses meant one thing, it meant hopeless. There's nothing we can do. Make him comfortable because his life is ending. There was another tent that on the outside looked exactly the same, but the doctors would evaluate that soldier and tie a blue ribbon. Blue meant hope. It didn't mean they were out of the woods yet, but man, there's a good chance they're gonna survive. And then the third one was green. They would nourish them, give them hydration, and they would help mend them back to health, but ultimately they were gonna be okay. Well, this particular young man that I'm talking about, 21, had a red ribbon, hopeless. There's nothing we can do. It's a little 20-year-old, little Baptist girl from Indiana. She's a nurse making her rounds, and she had her clipboard, and she was super busy, and super focused on what she had to do, and I think we can all relate to that. Just walking by people and the craziness and the pace of our lives. That she wasn't really taking a lot of time. Her bedside manner was struggling, but she got to this one guy and she just felt a connection to him. She knew she was in the hopeless tent. That's where she was assigned. While she was talking to them, she, she said, hey buddy, where are you from? He said, I'm from Indiana. She said, no way, I'm from Indiana. What part? And he told her, she said, that's like 20 minutes from each other. What school did you go to? And he told her, and she's like, that's, that's this, that's the, I go to, and she named it, and he's like, whoa, we're football rivals. I don't even know if we can talk. <laughs> and she goes, do you know so-and-so? And he's like, I do, do you know so-and-so? And they realized that so many mutual friends, and she felt hopeless. Man, I could have connected. We could have been friends. We ran in the same circles, and now this dear brother's hopeless. There's nothing we can do. And she said, can I pray for you? So she prays for him. Good old Baptist girl, she believes that God can heal and she prays and while she's praying for him, she begins to move in compassion. She digs in her nurse's jacket, pulls out a blue ribbon. And she said, please don't tell anybody I did this and unties the red one and tucks it in her pocket. 
He goes, What's, what, is that? What, is, what does that mean? And she said, don't worry about it. Ties the blue ribbon around his boot and walks out. A few hours later, the doctors came in and they were like, why is he in here? We've got him in the wrong tent. And they move him to the hope-filled tent where they rush him into surgery. And within a couple weeks, he went from hopeless to hope to completely whole. One act of compassion, one act of getting in the way of someone's storm and re re realizing there's healing in their hands and doing what she could do. The war ends on September 2nd, 1945. They go back to their everyday lives and he ends up going to her little town. He said, I need to repay you. I'd like to take you to lunch. This is 1945. I'd like to take you for a milkshake. I don't know what they were done. <laughs> Something like that. That date ended up into another date. Ended up into meeting parents. Ended up in getting engaged. Ended up getting married. Ended up being married for 60 years and having six kids and 21 grandkids. Everything changed, not only for his life, but the entire trajectory of her life. I believe that life moves at the speed of relationships. For some people, it's a season. For some people, it's an encounter. But for everyone, we're called to go and point them to Jesus. Come on, give the Lord praise. Another shift that I have been really intentional about this year is when I walk into a room, I want to have a there you are, not here am I sort of attitude. Because in our humanity, it's like, yo, what's up? I've arrived. Hey. But it's a whole lot better to say, hey, there you are. What can I do for you? So let's change our perspective. Let's run on purpose. Go and recognize that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. Let's walk in love. And then the final play, as we bring this in to the... 20 yard line and y'all still got time to beat the Baptist to the sizzler. Oh, okay. <laughs> the last play is we need to run together. The enemy loves isolation. The enemy loves for you to think that you're better on your own. The enemy loves that through damaged moments and messy moments and broken hearted moments that you try to protect yourself and say, I don't need anybody. But here's the truth. If you want to go somewhere fast, by all means go alone. But if you want to go somewhere far, we're called to go together. We're better together. Say that out loud. Say we're better together. That's why we believe the heartbeat of heaven is the local church. That's why we believe proximity matters. That's why if you can watch online, watch online. But man, if you can get into the house of God and build community and be a part of a connect group, then do it. Do whatever you can do to surround yourself around people that can sharpen you. The paraplegics laying on the mat and these four guys walk by and we don't know theologically if they were buddies with him or not. But they see him laying there. He can't move. And they could have been like, man, what a bummer, right? All right, see you later. Like, no, but instead they're like, man, Jesus is, have you heard of him? He's right down here at this house doing a Bible study. Every time anybody gets around him, he gets healed. Come on, grab a corner. These four guys pick this dude up and walk him to the Bible study. They try to go in the front door. The place is packed. It's like Hope City. <laughs> try to get him in the back. I can't get in here. Try to get him in a window. Nothing we can do here. They could have just set him down and been like, we tried, bro, sorry, and walked away. But they were like, let's try to get him up on the roof. Like, that's crazy, right? So they hoist his dear brother up on the roof and they're like, the only way to get in is to bust through the ceiling. That's different than just shingles and stuff that we deal with. It's six, seven inches of tile, years after years after years. And they begin to bust through the roof. They begin to break through the roof. You, you know people are in there like, what's happening? Like, They lower him right where Jesus is at. Jesus ministers to him. And he said, it is the faith of your friends that have made you whole. We're better together. Say this out loud. There's safety in the pack. I believe this. One night I couldn't sleep. You ever been so tired like you couldn't sleep? Like you're just so exhausted. You're like, I'm so tired. I can't sleep. I just eat. And it's just me. I'm just snack attack. <laughs> So I'm sitting at this hotel and I'm flipping through the channels and I stopped on Animal Planets. I don't ever do that. But this Australian guy, his voice was drawing me like a moth to a flame. He's like, you've got to watch the pack. And I'm like, yes, I am. And he's talking about a, a pride of lions and then this pack of wolves and how there's strength in this pack and the strength when they're together. And then they begin to talk about these gazelles. And gazelles aren't as uniform. They don't really have the pack, but when they're together, they're safer from the enemy, but there was this one little guy who was weaker than the others, and as long as he was in the protection of the gazelle, the enemy didn't attack him. 
For days, the pride of lions followed these gazelles and they just kept watching. And one day, this little gazelle decided, ah, I'm better on my own. I can move faster on my own. I don't need community and connect groups. I don't need this. Some of you are like, he said that? What a weird... Is- the gazelle said he didn't need a connect group. That's odd. No, just follow me. Just jump in. Stay with me. I, I'm better on my own. I, I can do this on my own. And he got away from the safety of his pack and the enemy attacked. Do not find yourself in isolation and don't allow the enemy to lie to you and tell you you're the only one walking through the stuff you're going through. We all have wounds. We all have stuff that we got to get healed, fixed. Would you stand your feet as we bring this in for a landing across all locations? We're better together. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 4, and I love the way the message translation reads. It says, in this way, we are like the various parts of the human body. We're talking about the local church. We're talking about the body of Christ. It's not just the building we meet in. Every single one of us have gifts and skill sets. You have things I can't do. And I've got things maybe like some of y'all can grow hair. I can't ever have crunchy bangs. It's just not in my future. But I believe that there are things that God is wanting to unlock in us. But maybe you're here and you say, man, I come. But the truth is I'm I'm here. I've struggled. I've struggled going, speaking life into people. I've struggled because the truth is you you hit it on the head. I, I haven't received that love. I feel like I'm better on my own. I don't feel like I'm better together. That's what the Bible says in Romans 2. In this way, we're like the various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of a chosen people. That's you. That's us. Each of us finds ourself, finds our meaning and function as a part of the body, but as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body. Watch this. Let's just go ahead and be what we're made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other, trying to be something we aren't. Every single one of you, there's a resounding yes that there's a place for you here at Hope City. Maybe you're like, well, I want to be on the worship team, but you're the only person that knows you can sing. Maybe it's not for you. (laughs) But there's other areas that God maybe would unlock in you here. Maybe you can make a mean cup of coffee. Maybe you're super happy. Maybe your joy is contagious and you'd be amazing as a greeter. You'd be amazing serving on our dream team, our load in load out team in the parking lot. Maybe you have a heart and passion to reach the next generation and our kids, unless you're a weird person, then we're not gonna let you do that. You know what I mean? Like, but there's things that God wants to unlock in you. But here's the reality. And this is just the way church is because this is humanity and this is life. Maybe you walked in, you say, Daniel, The truth is, man, I've got a red ribbon tied around my boot. I have felt pretty hopeless. Our prayer week in and week out, our prayer in our connect groups is that you would walk in and you would replace that hopeless ribbon for hope. And then ultimately the end goal is for you to walk out and recognize that you were healed and you were made completely whole. But I know I know there are people here, and as I was bringing out these plays and talking about go into all the world, you're like, I barely can take care of my own life. Walk in love? Ah, you don't have any idea what I've been through. Maybe you wear a tag around your neck that says damaged goods or fragile. I believe God wants you to trade that in today. If there's any area of your life that feels hopeless, it's been under the influence of a lie because there's hope today. His name is Jesus, and he wants to restore, heal, fix and put stitches where you've been putting band-aids. Would you lift your hands towards heaven? Father, this is my prayer for every person in this room, additional seating, Cypress Cornerstone, Katie, our Tanzania campus that we'll watch later, people that will watch later on YouTube and stream it in the archive. God, there are people that are here now and on the sound of my voice, something in their hearts have been convincing them of the fact that there's more to life than the way they've been living it. And the truth is, God, saying things like go into all the world, they need help in that area because they don't feel that they can step into that purpose yet. God, walking in love and showing people love, they need to receive that love. God, I pray today that they would begin to feel your supernatural touch. Right now, God, you would begin to rest upon them. Every person 
Every person that hears this, God, I pray, Lord, that the power, the unconditional agape God kind of love would begin to rest on them, God, that they would begin to release. This is what I want you to do. Would you begin to cast some cares on the Lord? 1 Peter 5, 7, would you just begin to let go of some distractions and let go of some things that have been muddying the waters of your confidence? Let go of some things that have been trying to keep you from stepping into your greatest days. God, I pray that they would, they would be, this, this, this situation, this distraction, this issue would be replaced with your supernatural love. Then ultimately, God, I pray that that isolation, that I'm better on my own sort of posture, God, I pray, Lord, that they would surrender that now and they would recognize that we're better together. They would recognize, God, that community, safety in the pack, that we can do so many more things when we go further together to heal, restore, deliver. God, I pray right now for your healing power to touch physical bodies right now. The diagnosis is reversed today. That strength is beginning to quicken in bodies. That Isaiah 58, 8 is is true today that just as the sure, just as sure as the sun will rise, health, strength, and life is springing forth speedily. That your righteousness goes out in front of us and your glory overtakes us. God, I thank you for restoration in marriages. I thank you, Lord God, for restoration in hope and families. I thank you that addictions are breaking off. I thank you that your healing power is going out, ministering to, and restoring hope today. In Jesus' name. Come on, can somebody give the Lord praise all over this room? So sign up for a connect group. If you're sitting on the fence like, I don't know if I want to do it or not, just do it. It's also Baptism Sunday. Jump in, get baptized. If you want to take that next step today, with every eye closed as we bring this in to the end zone. If you're here today and you say, Daniel, man, the truth is I, 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 wanna, <laughs> I wanna go into all the world. I wanna talk about the good news. I wanna walk in love and I, and I wanna get into a community like this, but the truth is I don't know Jesus. Every eye closed just for a moment. Don't leave just yet. Stay where you're at just for a moment. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to today. The whole time you've been ministering today, I've realized I've had a gaping hole in my heart and it needs to be filled with the love of God. Or maybe you're the second invitation and you say, the truth is, I used to walk with the Lord, but I fell away and I got caught up in the prodigal life. But today is the day that I want to surrender again and I want to make things right. I want to recommit my life across all locations. If you're here today, you want to give your life to God or rededicate, I'm going to count to three. We will not embarrass you. We're not even going to pray a prayer in a moment for symbolic reasons. Here at Hope City, we declare the word. Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. One, I want to get my life right with God. Two, I want to rededicate. Three, if that's you, lift up your hand. Come on all over the room and hands going up everywhere. Hands, 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 hands. I know they're going up in additional seating. Campus pastors, look across your locations. Hands going up everywhere. Awesome. You can put your hands down from the back of the room to our Hope City worship team. We're all going to pray right now together as a church family. The Bible says that heaven rejoices if just for the one. Everybody pray this prayer so that all of our friends who lifted their hands today won't feel uncomfortable. Say this with me. Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. Every mistake, every sin, all of my struggles, I lay at your feet and I ask for your forgiveness. From this moment on, I'm going to live for you. I confess you now as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, give the Lord praise and rejoice with heaven.